Hello maths fans, Dr Tom Crawford here at the University of Oxford with a special video celebrating Maths Week London. Today we're going to be talking about the infamous quadratic formula. We'll start by figuring out where it comes from and then we'll apply it to some real world problems from football and archery. To start with, let's remind ourselves what the formula actually looks like. So given a general quadratic formula, ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero, then the quadratic formula tells us that the solutions are given by x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. Now, like me, you've probably heard this so many times that it's now stuck in your head and you couldn't possibly forget it. And that's fine. Knowing the formula means you can use it to solve any quadratic equation. But what we want to think about here is where this actually comes from. Can we derive this formula starting from a general quadratic equation? And the answer, of course, is yes. And in order to do this, we use a method called completing the square. Let's look at a simple example with the equation x squared plus 6x plus 1 is equal to 0. Now, the method of completing the square requires us to write something squared plus or minus something is equal to 0. And this is why it's called completing the square, because you take your quadratic and you write at least part of it as something squared, then hopefully we can rearrange and square root both sides to get the solution. That's the idea in theory. Now in order to figure out what goes in our bracket, we have to look at these first two terms. So to get the x squared term, we have to have an x by itself, because then we'll have x plus something multiplied by itself, and then the two x's combined to give you the x squared term. And then the second term, we want to look at the coefficient that's on the x term, because we get one lot of it from x times the something, and then the same thing again from the something times the x. So here, what we actually want is exactly half of this coefficient to go into our bracket. So for this simple case where we just have an x squared term by itself, the first term is always x, and then the second term when completing the square is just half of the coefficient in front of x in your original equation. Because if we now expand this out, we'll get x squared plus 3x plus another 3x plus 9. Now, we have the x squared term that we wanted. We then have plus 6x, again, exactly what we wanted, but we have an extra plus 9. So what we do to get rid of this, because this is an extra term we've added, is we subtract off the 9, and then we just have the plus 1 left over. Now this, of course, can be simplified. We turn this into minus 8, and then you take the 8 across or add 8 to both sides, and what we end up with is x plus 3 squared is equal to 8. And this is the advantage of the method of completing the square, because we started with our full quadratic equation, and then we've rewritten it in terms of something squared equal to some number. So now we square root both sides to get x plus 3 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 8, which finally tells us that x is minus 3 plus or minus the square root of 8. So these are our two solutions to our original quadratic equation.
Of course, we expect to get the same answer by just plugging in our a, b, and c values to the quadratic formula. So here a is going to be 1, b is going to be 6, and c is going to be 1. So let's just double check that. So x should be equal to minus b, so that's minus 6, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is going to be 36, minus 4 lots of a, that's 1, c is also 1, so 4ac is just 4, and then all divided by 2 times 1, which is 2. And now, of course, we need to simplify this a little bit because it doesn't quite look like our answer down here, but it's looking quite close. So we can divide through to get minus 3, and then we've got plus or minus a half times the square root of 32. So the minus 3 now matches up, and to get rid of this final factor of a half, what we need to do is simplify the square root using our properties of thirds. So that becomes minus 3 plus or minus a half. This is root 4 times root 8. And of course, the square root of 4 is 2. So those two cancel. And our final answer is minus 3 plus or minus root 8, which is exactly what we got down here using our method of completing the square. Now, just to make sure we've really got our heads around this method of completing the square, let's look at one more example. And this time we're going to put a coefficient on the x squared term. And as we will see, this will slightly change how the method works. So as before, we want something squared, and then we'll add or subtract some things, and we need that equal. To zero. So this term has to be the square of the first term in our bracket. So before it was just x squared, so we wrote x. Here we have 4x squared, so we actually need 2x here, because 2x multiplied by itself gives you the 4x squared. So this first term has to be 2x, and then when we square the bracket, 2x multiplied by itself will give us the 4x squared. Now the second term, before, when we just had an x, we said you take half of the coefficient. But it doesn't quite work that way in this context. Because again, what we've got here is going to be 4x squared, when we expand out, plus something... So let's just write this as plus. I'll call it y for now. And when we expand out, we're going to get plus 2y times x, and then plus the same thing again. So really, we've got 4xy, and we need 4y to be equal to 8. So we need 4y is equal to 8, which tells us that y has to be equal to 2. So if we go back in here and make this 2, now when we expand out we will get 4x squared plus 4x from this term plus another 4x from this term, and then we're left with a plus 4 from the two constants, so we subtract off 4 and then we add our 1. As before, we can tidy this equation up to get 2x plus 2 squared. That's going to give me minus 3, so add 3 to both sides is equal to 3. So now if I square root, I get 2x plus 2 equals plus or minus the square root of 3. And so therefore, 2x is minus 2 plus or minus root 3, which means x is going to be minus 2 plus or minus root 3, all divided by 2. As before, we can also find the same solution using our quadratic formula, so let's just double check in this case. So a is now 4, b is 8, and c is 1. So my formula tells me that x is equal to 
minus 8 plus or minus the square root of 8 squared is 64 minus 4 times a, so that's 4 times but minus 16 times 1, so minus 16, all divided by 2a, so that's divided by 8. That simplifies to give me minus 1 plus or minus 1 eighth, the square root of 48. I can get a 4 factor out of that equation, so I can write that as root 16 times root 3, now going to be minus 1 plus or minus a half root 3, which is the same as I've got down here if I'd simplified the minus 2 over 2. Gives me minus 1 plus or minus a half root 3. So we have the same answer from completing the square and from using the quadratic formula. I'd say we are now just about ready to have a go at applying the method of completing the square to our general quadratic equation. And hopefully this will give us the quadratic formula. However, there is one final step or one final modification that we're going to make to this general equation. And that is to first multiply the whole equation by a. By doing this, we get a squared times x squared on our first term. And this really helps when it comes to completing the square because as we've just seen in the last example, we want this term to be square rooted to give us the first term in our bracket. So I could have just square rooted a x squared and had root a times x, but it doesn't look very nice and it's only going to cause us problems later on. So if I multiply through by a, I don't change the equation because the whole thing is equal to zero. And it means that the first term in our bracket, when we now complete the square, is going to be a times x. So something squared minus something plus ac will now give us zero. And it's up to us to figure out as before, what goes in this second position inside the square bracket. So like before, we look at this term. So clearly we need a b term in there because there's no other b term coming from our first term. So the only way to get a b into the result is if b is in the second position. However, if I were to now expand this in its current form, I would get a squared x squared plus ax times b, and then plus another ax b. So I'm actually getting one too many because I just want abx, and here I've got two lots of abx. So what we need to do is just divide that by two because then both of these then give me a half contribution. Ax times b over 2 is axb over 2. So I get that twice from that way around and then the other way around to give me the correct second term in my general equation. And of course, like before, we subtract off the constant, which here is b squared over at this point, we're actually not too far away from the final solution, even though it might not quite yet look like it. So the first thing we're going to do is actually multiply through by 4, because at the moment we're dividing by 4 here, which doesn't look very nice. So let's get rid of all of our fractions. And again, the whole equation is equal to 0. So when I multiply through by 4, it doesn't affect the right hand side. So multiplying by 4, I have 4 lots of ax plus b over 2 squared minus b squared, 4's cancel, plus 4ac equals 0. And now I want to take this 4 inside the bracket. So 4 outside is equal to 2 squared. So I can replace this by 2 squared. 
And now since both of these terms have a squared on them, I can take the two inside the bracket. So the two goes inside the bracket and it will now give me 2ax plus b, where the twos cancel, squared minus b squared plus 4ac equals zero. Now following the method for completing the square, the next step remember was to have the square bracket on one side of the equation and everything else on the other side. So if we do that, we get 2ax plus b squared is equal to b squared minus 4ac. Now this is starting to look familiar because this term is what's appearing in our square root. And the next step in the method of completing the square is to square root both sides of our equation. So if we do that, we end up with 2ax plus b is equal to plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac. We now subtract b from both sides. 2ax is minus b plus or minus the square root, and finally divide both sides by 2a, x is minus b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a, and you'll notice this equation is exactly the same as our quadratic formula. Just to recap what we've done, we start with our general quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c is zero. We multiply through by a, just to make the algebra a little nicer. So a squared x squared plus abx plus ac is zero. We then complete the square to get ax plus b over two squared, subtract off the constant term b squared over four plus ac, multiply by four, where the two goes inside the bracket, because two squared is equal to four. Then we put b squared minus 4ac on the right hand side, we added it to both sides of the equation. Then we square root, remembering the plus or minus. Then you subtract b from both sides, divide through by 2a. And what we've shown is that for any general quadratic equation with coefficients a, b and c, we can in fact write out the general solution, aka the quadratic formula, by using the method of completing the square. Now that we've derived the quadratic formula, let's see what we can do with it. And the first application I want to share with you is not only my favorite application of maths pretty much ever, it's also very apt given the ongoing football tournament Euro 2020. Suppose we want to work out the perfect placement of a penalty kick in a game of football. We can start by drawing our goalposts. So a standard goal is a rectangle, which is 7.32 meters across the bottom and 2.44 meters in height. And the numbers here will be important. Now, when you're taking your penalty, you want to avoid the goalkeeper. And here we're going to represent the goalkeeper by something called the diving range. Now this has been calculated scientifically from experiments. This is how far a goalkeeper can dive in approximately half a second between the ball being kicked and the ball crossing the line and entering the net. And this is a semicircle which has a radius equal to 2.86 meters. Now when it comes to taking our penalty, we want to be as far away from the goalkeeper as possible, as far away from the crossbar as possible, and as far away from the post as possible. So what we actually want to do is aim for the center of this circle in the top corner of the goal. And of course this would be mirrored, you could also aim for the top left corner of the goal, depending on your preference. But the perfect placement 
is going to be the center of this circle. And let's suppose this circle has an unknown radius x. Given this setup, the only thing that we don't know is this distance x, the radius of our circle. So if we can work out the value of x, which we'll do in a minute with some clever geometry, then that will tell us where we should aim our penalty kick. And this is the perfect placement because it allows for the maximum amount of error. Because if we aim for the center of the circle, even if we miss by a tiny amount or even a reasonable amount in any direction, we are safely away from the crossbar, the post and the goalkeeper. So we're actually allowing ourselves the biggest possible error whilst also being away from the three things that we want to avoid that might cause us to miss the penalty. So the trick is to figure out an equation for this unknown variable x. The first thing we do is to draw a triangle like this. So this is a right angled triangle, which now actually allows us to use Pythagoras' theorem. The length squared plus this length squared is equal to the diagonal length squared. Plugging the numbers into Pythagoras' theorem actually gives us the following equation for this unknown value x. And it says that x squared minus 18x plus 11 must be equal to zero. So solving this quadratic equation will actually give us the radius of our circle and that therefore tells us where to aim our penalty kick to have the mathematically highest possible chance of success. And this is of course solved using our quadratic formula. So we plug those numbers in which tells us that x is equal to minus b, so that's 18, plus or minus the square root of 18 squared, which is 324, minus 4 times a, so minus 4 times 1 times 11 minus 44, all divided by 2. And when you plug in those numbers, you do need a calculator for this it will come out that x is about 0.63 meters. So the answer to the question of where you should aim your penalty kick to maximize your chance of scoring is exactly 0.63 meters inside the post and 0.63 meters below the crossbar. The second real world example we're going to look at comes from archery. Imagine you're an archer given the task of defending your city from invasion. You stand atop of the fortified walls as the enemy approaches in the distance. Out of the corner of your eye, you spot a battering ram slowly edging forwards towards your city walls. But fortunately, you have some flaming arrows at your disposal and one accurate shot could set the wooden ram on fire and save the city. The question is, at what distance away do you fire your arrow? As with most problems of this type, it's very helpful to draw a diagram of the setup. So here we have the archer with the bow and the flaming arrow standing on top of the city wall, which I'm going to say is 10 meters above the ground. So this is a height of 10 meters. We have the battering ram in the distance, which is moving towards the city. And we want to shoot our arrow such that it perfectly hits the battering ram, setting it on fire and saving the city. So if we call this distance x meters, this is our unknown value that we need to calculate. And then in terms of other things we know in the setup of the problem, we need to know about the properties of the arrow as it's fired 
from the bow. Now, fortunately, archers are well trained to fire at a certain angle with a certain initial velocity. And we can get that information. So we know that our initial velocity is going to be about 150 miles an hour or 66 meters per second. And the angle that we're firing at above the horizontal, so this angle here, theta, is going to be 30 degrees. We actually now have all of the information we need to solve the problem. So neglecting air resistance, which is very common for projectile motion problems such as this one, we can write out Galileo's equations of motion, which tell us that the horizontal distance x is equal to the initial velocity, v0, multiplied by time, multiplied by cos of theta, where theta is this initial angle at which you fire the projectile. And y is equal to your initial velocity v0 times t times sine of theta minus a half g for gravitational acceleration and t squared. Now we know v0 and we know theta. So for theta equals 30, that tells us the cos of theta is equal to the square root of 3 divided by 2, and sine of theta is equal to 1 half. And again, we know v0 is equal to 66. So our equations over here actually become x equals, that's going to be 33 root 3 times time, and y is going to be 33 times time minus a half times 10 times t squared. So at the moment, in these equations, it looks as though we have three unknowns for two equations. We don't know time yet. We don't know x, which remember is the distance we're trying to calculate, the distance between the battering ram and the wall where we're firing from. And at the moment, we don't know the value of y. However, we actually do know the value of y. Because if we look at our diagram, if I take the point where we're standing to be zero, because this is our reference where we're firing from, then by the time the arrow has traveled and has hit the battering ram, it's gone vertically from where it started, it's gone down by 10 meters. So at the point when we hit the battering ram, y here has to actually be equal to minus 10. And now we have two equations for x and t with our two unknowns, x and t. So we can now solve this to figure out the solution for a horizontal distance x. We start by calculating t, the time of flight, or the time taken for the arrow to reach the ram after leaving our bow. And that's just going to be the solution of this quadratic equation. So it's got the same form as our general quadratic up here, except now we're solving for t rather than some general unknown variable. So if we rearrange this equation, we've got 5t squared, putting this on this side, minus 33t minus 10 is equal to zero. So the quadratic formula says that t is equal to minus b, so 33, plus or minus the square root of 33 squared, which is 1089, minus four times a, so minus 20, times minus 10, so that's plus 200 all divided by 2a, which is 10. So the time it takes for the arrow to leave our bow and to descend 10 meters is given by the solution to this equation. And if you plug these numbers into your calculator, you'll get the answer here is that t is equal to 6.89 seconds. Now that we've got the time, we plug this 
into our equation for x. So x is just 33 times the square root of 3 times 6.89 seconds, and you get the final solution that x is approximately 393 meters. So for our archer, in this situation, it says that once the battering ram is around 400 meters or so away from the castle wall, that's when you want to start firing. Because we've of course used a lot of approximations here. We approximated gravity, we neglected air resistance, the angle might not be perfect. So there's going to be a little bit of leeway in this number, but it tells you to not leave it too late to make sure we can get it as early as possible when the ram's around 400 meters away, start firing those arrows and you just might have a chance of saving the city. And that brings us to the end of this special video for Maths Week London. Do check out all of the other amazing activities happening across the capital city this week to celebrate the joy of maths. Thank you everybody for watching. Please do remember to subscribe to the channel if you've enjoyed the video and I'll see you all very soon. Take care.